Welcome to this broadcast, friends. Today is the 2nd of the 2nd, 23. My name is Paul and Peter in Scotland. Very pleased to be here with you all. Um, we are in Lamentations Chapter 3, uh, Part 2. Yes, so, um, you know, uh, the thoughts in my heart this morning um, have been about the holiness, the righteousness and the goodness of God and how God longs to, to reach mankind and to reconcile uh, and redeem and restore mankind to himself. To it, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. You know, friends, to be a successful believer in Christ Jesus, uh, it involves acceptance of the will of God, um, acceptance of what pertains at the present time. Um, of course, the lie in, in modern Christendom in, in, in America uh, is is that, that God wants you 100% healthy and 100% wealthy. Well, that's just not the case. That's not the reality. Of course, God is not necessarily against anyone being uh, healthy and wealthy, on the contrary. Um, uh, but not everyone. You know, I mean, what about all the persons in Europe and South America that were brutally killed under the auspices of Christianity by the wicked Roman Catholic system? Uh, what about the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Israel um, in, in the first century? They were disemboweled, tortured, crucified, set on fire to be night lamps for the, the, the orgies of the, the Roman occupiers of Israel, um, which, of course, is, 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 it was, I suppose was a type of, of the wickedness of the Roman empirical Catholic system. Um, 1500 years later during the medieval ages so you know you, you think of, of what the saints endured and the things that saints went through um, and there's many things that mortals do not understand about the will of Elohim Yahweh and the purposes of God um, I mean truly truly true wealth is love grace power and strength to to lead a, a soul prosperous life uh, a life of blessing and love and service to others. That's true wealth. Um, you see, so I mean, uh, what is the purpose of cash other than to buy clothing, warmth, shelter and food? Uh, you know, uh, and as, as, I, as I leave this message just now, or as I broadcast this message, um, many men are obsessed with gain, you know. Um, and yet they never gain Christ Jesus. But to gain Christ is to count all the things lost, the excellency of the knowledge of the Son of God. So my thoughts are many, I suppose, but I was thinking, um, you know, about the goodness of God leading men to repentance, a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction. And, and in case I have any tender listeners that, that would consider themselves Catholics, I'm speaking of the system of popery uh, that's responsible for terrible atrocities, principally during the Inquisitions, which thing the, uh, the, pop, the popish system of Rome has never repented or never publicly apologised for, not that they could, such was the gross atrocities that have been swept under the carpet of history. Um, and of course, the... Uh, the persons that run the empirical system uh, of tyranny, for, of superstition and idolatry um, over there in, in the Vatican, they, they hope that these things won't come to light. Well, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will bring every hidden thing to light. Full exposure, full revelation of everything. Oh, yes. God requires that which is past friends. The day shall declare it. Prepare to meet your God. Of course, there are millions of persons that, uh, that follow systems such as uh, Mohammedanism or Catholicism or, or the Mormon systems, all these systems of men. Um, and they and they are very strong that they follow that belief system and they proclaim and announce that instead of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the problem. I was talking with a man last week and within a few short minutes, it became clear that his message was the Watchtower organization. His message 
was the system of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It wasn't Christ Jesus, crucified, buried, risen, ascended, ruling and reigning imminently. Uh, wasn't the uh, the message of the atonement, the message of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. No. His message was a system of men. And it's the same today. If you, if you go around the streets and talk with many persons about faith, they would they would speak uh, idolatrous terms such as oh i'm this oh i'm that well what about the son of god what about christ jesus oh well uh, uh, uh. you see these these are persons that are confused you see um, and and god is gracious you see god is gracious to all friends otherwise persons would be dead uh, but the truth is many mortals are deceived and deluded by terms and uh, they pledge their allegiance to different uh, organizations and belief systems uh, whilst not having any true connection morally and responsibly with the Son of God. We think of the days we live in, and the person say, oh, I'm this or I'm that. It's all meaningless. You know, the Creator is not religious, friends. There is one maker, and that which is made. A great thing to contemplate these things and at the same time to understand the goodness and the benevolence and the loving kindness of Elohim Yehovah God to understand the reality of these things and to be gracious to such persons remember God is gracious <clears throat> such persons are deceived and bedeviled and deluded uh, it's the human condition you know, see um, we, we also have the Cornelius in the book of Acts. Now, Cornelius, it says, uh, well, I suppose we could turn to it. It's an interesting uh, discourse on the topic of, uh, of God's grace and wisdom concerning all, um, um, regardless of the exactitudes uh, of, of their profession of faith. So here's Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He was a centurion. You see, so he's a Roman centurion, probably a very rough, tough kind of man. But it says he was pious, and he and his whole household feared God. And when they were very kind to mankind, they gave much alms to the people, and they supplicated God continually. So quite a man, this Cornelius. No doubt a wealthy, influential uh, man, and a, probably a very physical man. Um, and he was godly. And he feared God with all his household. And he was very kind, a man of great prayer. Stayed in prayer continually. And he saw a vision. Uh, and an angel of God came to him and actually addressed him by name, Cornelius. But he, having fixed his eyes upon him, became full of fear and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your arms have gone up for a memorial before God. So we see here, a man that didn't know the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see a man here that was kind, was prayerful, and was a responsible head of his household. He and his household um, feared God. They were very kind, so probably very wealthy. They were persons of prayer and godliness. So the angel says, your prayers and your kindness has come up for a memorial before God. What a thing, friends. So it wasn't his doctrinal statement. You know, it was simply his, his, his faith and trust and, and the, the exemplification of that faith and trust was kindness. See, so, so God is very gracious. And then, of course, then he has the revelation of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, through Simon Peter, who was living in the house of Simon, Shimeon by the sea. See, and you can read the story yourselves, friends. Uh, Acts chapter ten, very important to to an instructive to contemplate the sovereignty of God. You see, and there are many other such instances in in Scripture as well. You know, and um, and Peter himself had had great revelation. Peter himself, of course, uh, had written First uh, and Second Peter. 
Uh, probably not at this moment, actually, but later on in his life, Peter went on to write First and Second Peter. But at, probably at the writing of the Book of Acts by Dr. Luke, the disciple who wrote the Gospel of Luke, um, the epistles of Peter have probably not yet been written. But anyway, Peter was the disciple who cast off his garments and jumped naked into the sea to be with the Lord. Uh, he tried to uh, to walk on the water with the Lord Jesus. Of course, he denied Christ three times when he was getting a warm, um, getting some natural rewards whilst denying Christ uh, three times. But Peter, after all that, he still needed further adjustment. You see, he still uh, viewed uh, himself as better than the non-Jewish persons because of his Jewish lineage. And so he has this sheet come down from heaven um, and there's all kinds of creatures on there. And the message to him is, is also about natural food. Don't call unclean what God has cleansed, you see. So humans are not to, to view themselves as better than other humans um, just because they're Jewish, you see. So that, that's what that's about. So Peter had just had further adjustment um, and then he's sent to Cornelius to give Cornelius further adjustment in the truth. You see. And what happens is, of course, uh, <clears throat> Cornelius becomes uh, a servant of the Lord Jesus. So they said, Cornelius, uh, who is a righteous man, feared God, born witness to by the whole nation of the Jews, you see, so this was a Roman man that was born witness by the whole nation of the Jews, who was respected by the Jews. He'd been divinely instructed by a holy angel to send for Peter. So it's a great, it's a great thing to, to read uh, Acts chapter 10. But come, come, let's come back to today's portion of scripture, friends. Now, so Lamentations chapter three now if you'd like to hear the whole chapter read friends um that is on the previous podcast uh, which is simply called lamentations three um this is lamentations three part two so we read the entire 66 verses on the previous broadcast and we expanded the first third the first 22 verses um, and of course, what you're reading about is the feelings and the mind and the heart of Jesus. Uh, that's what you're reading about in this, this portion of scripture. Um, I would say the difference between this and the, the venerable Song of Songs uh, would be that this is more generally concerning all mankind and the general state of mankind, whereas... Uh, and, and of course, Jeremiah is a prophet, uh, but he was also of the tribe of the priests. One of one of few prophets that was both of the tribe of priests and was a prophet. And as regards the books of scripture, um, Ezekiel was another one who was of the tribe of priests. Um, so, so you have here in this book, the feelings of Jesus concerning mankind in general, in the Song of Songs, it's the feelings of Jesus concerning his wife, his redeemed, his bride, his church, you see, his congregation. And of course, um, Solomon, who wrote most of the Proverbs and the uh, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, sometimes called Canticles, he is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in resurrection, in ascension, and in sovereign dominical rule over all things. Whereas the great King David, is, he, re, he would represent Christ before the cross. He would very much represent the Lord Jesus greatly. Uh, but he was not allowed to build the house of Elohim Yehovah because he had so much blood on his hands. These persons we read about in scripture were very, very physical men. You wouldn't have messed around with, with David or Solomon. You know, the, these men, or, or indeed Cornelius, these men were men's men, you know. And, and of course, uh, it's the most wonderful thing to think of God's dealings with these persons and, and that their tenderness and their benevolence and their compassion and their goodness shone through in the Psalms and the Proverbs and, and the Song of Songs. 
Now, this brings us to chapter three of Lamentations. So we, we ended actually 22, 23. I shall read uh, Lamentations 3, 22. It is of Yahweh's loving kindness that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Yahweh is good to those that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that one should both wait and that in silence for the salvation of Yahovah. Now, I would very much like my listeners to, to learn a few, just a few words of Hebrew. Uh, and I suppose the most important one is the word Jesus, which is Yeshua. There are other de derivatives, Yahshua, Yahushua, Yahoshua, Yahusha, but Yeshua, will suffice and, and that is the the hebrew word for jesus yeshua so it sounds like joshua so it's the same word joshua um, but it, there was no j back then it was a y you see so we say joshua it sounds like joshua joshua there is a difference but the j only came into usage in the mid middle ages you see in the middle middle europe um, but at any rate, it's Yeshua. So in verse 26, when we read, it is good that one should both wait, and that in silence, for the Yeshua, Hayahuah. See this verse here, friends. So that word for salvation, nine times out of ten, when you see the word salvation, what we call the Old Testament, it is the word Yeshua. And that means Jesus. Jesus is your salvation. And Jesus is Yeshua. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah. See? So Yeshua is the Hebrew name of Jesus. See? Jesus is a really an Italian uh, Latin uh, word. Isu, Isus, Jesus, Isu, Isu, Isu. You see, so but in Hebrew, be Yeshua. So when you read here, it's good that one should both wait and that in silence for the Yeshua of Yahuwah. It literally means that mankind should wait in silence for the Jesus of the Lord. That's literally what it says. You should wait in silence for the Jesus of Yahuwah. That's literally what it says, the Yeshua of Yahuwah. And once reminded of one of my favorite verses of scripture, um, stand still and see the Yeshua, Ayahua. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. See? Well, that's literally stand still and see the Jesus of the Lord. Well, that's literally what the verse means. So to a Hebrew believer, when they read these verses, you see, that's what they read. Wait in silence for the Yeshua HaYahuwah. Yeshua HaYahuwah. The Jesus of the Lord. It's a great thing to think of. So this is the, uh, the feelings of the Son of God, you see, declaring that it's good for mankind to wait in silence for the deliverance, the mercy, the salvation of the Lord, the Jesus of God. Think of the patience of the Christ at the present time, friends. Think of the Son of God patiently waiting for his wife, waiting to be seeing hundreds of millions of physical humans clothed with actual immortality, physically ascending through the skies to the physical marriage supper of the Lamb in the very near future. This is the next great event, friends. Not a new car, a new sexual liaison, or another bout of drunkenness, or a new couch, or a new car, or a new house. No. It's immortality and life 
for the redeemed. A thousand years of complete, pure, physical, actual righteousness on this planet a minute. The cessation of the rule of mortals, the cessation of the rule of devils, and the beginning of righteousness, holiness, faithfulness, and truth. The thousand years during which time all the doomed, deluded, ruined, vile, defiled will be chained and cast into the pitch darkness of the bottomless abyss. Yes. So this, these verses speak of the patience of Christ, waiting for his wife, waiting for his redeemed, waiting for his church, waiting for his bride. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of human beings that declared their faith in the Son of God. And many that were innocent or real problems with their mind, perhaps they couldn't see, perhaps they couldn't hear, perhaps they couldn't talk. But certainly all those that are in the Lamb's scroll of life. So you, you think of you think of Christ patiently waiting to receive hundreds of millions of persons. You think of the church throughout the history of the planet. Uh, think of all the redeemed, the, those that died in faith in Christ, those that trusted in the Son of God all waiting patiently for res physical resurrection, friends. You know, there are many questions as well in Scripture. Scripture says that when men die, their thoughts cease. But we read, uh, where far be seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Consider ye him well, lest ye grow weary in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin, friends. Persevere, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Take courage, take grace, take peace. To think of Christ waiting patiently for his own at this present time, friends. For he doth not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men, to crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of El Elyon, the Most High. To wrong a man in his cause, will not Adonai see it? Who is he that says, and there comes to pass, what the Lord has not commanded? So, one thing, so for, again, uh, I know I mentioned some of these verses in the previous broadcast, but it's a very good thing, friends, to memorise portions of scripture. Uh, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Uh, it's a very good thing to contemplate divine truth, to meditate on the truth of El Elyon Yahavar Elohim. A very great thing, friends. And, um, I think of uh, the Son of God in death, uh, put into the tomb, but even in death, preaching the good news of salvation and peace and pardon and power to departed human beings. I know it doesn't fit in with traditional Christian doctrine. It's absolutely true. You can read it in, in, in the epistles of Peter, friends. Jesus Christ preached to persons that had died in the time of the flood in the time of Noah. And he preached to them the gospel of reconciliation of redemption, of eternal life. And they exercised faith and trust, faith and trust in the Son of God. 
the Bible says that though they were judged in the flesh, they were justified in the spirit. It's a great portion of scripture to contemplate, friends. The tender mercies, the loving kindnesses of Elohim, Yahuwah, the bigger picture. Here we read of the heart of God. God doesn't willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. We think of the righteousness and the holiness of God, the perfections of the God of Jacob. We think of the tender mercies of God. We think of the divine nature, think of the heart and the mind and the purposes of Elohim Yahweh. We think of righteous indignation. A man said to me the other week, there's a, there's a topic of how we was discussing the topic of how persons get angry and that not all anger is wrong because some anger is righteous indignation. I mean, I personally, if I see someone littering, I thoroughly dislike littering. I really do. You know, I, a, long, well, a long time ago, I got into it. Well, I didn't, I said, well, I corrected him out for throwing a fish and chip card out of his car and he was very angry, very angry. But I'm glad I did it, you know, and uh, I just hate littering, I really do. Uh, and of course, uh, the devil is the vagrant. He's just a vagrant, right? he's a toothless lion uh, trying to steal away the truth out of the hearts and minds of the redeemed of the saints. Anyway, I was talking to this man the other week about anger. I was so angry, it's righteous indignation. If you went down the street and you, you saw a man beating his partner, beating his girlfriend or wife, you, the fact you'd be angry about it is not unrighteous. The man is unrighteous and you'd have righteous indignation, you see. And so the wrath of God, the, uh, the feelings of God are all righteous, you see. Yahovah is righteous. The righteous Yahovah Adonai Melech Hakavon, the King of Glory, is righteous. You see, Yahovah is righteous in all he does and all he says. You see, in terms of this verse, of course, this is uh, Lamentations 333. He doth not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. You see, so God doesn't say, right, I think I'll just punish that chap today. No, it's, it's as a result of, of, of wicked being, things like this, you see. It was a result of a person's behavior over a period of time. We have here this verse, uh, Lamentations 3, 3, 5, to turn aside the right of a man before the face of the Most High. So this has to do with the intercession, the mediation of Jesus, you see. Now, if you want to learn more about that, friends, you would do that in the five books of Psalms. The Psalms are principally intercessory mediatorial discourse in the Godhead between the Father and the Son concerning mankind. So when you read here to turn aside the right of Aman, that's the right of Christ, a saviour, intercessor, and judge before the face of El Elyon. course great thing to think of christ jesus as judge the judge of the whole earth the lord and savior and judge of all mankind creator redeemer savior lord judge king most high and the sovereign of all flesh who is he that says and there comes to pass what adonai has not commanded was Lamentations 337. So, so who is he that speaks and then it happens without the Lord commanding it first? Out of the mouth of El Elyon doth there not proceed evil and good. Very interesting verse, friends. And you don't quite get that verse quite like that anywhere else in scripture. It's unique. Out of the mouth of El Elyon, the Most High, doth there not proceed evil and good. Of course, we read in uh, James, 
that out of the mouth of a believer there shouldn't come forth evil and good. A fountain that would produce dirty water and clean water wouldn't be of much use. You wouldn't be sure what you, what you would get. It's a very interesting verse. But the righteous indignation of Jehovah Elohim, the righteous indignation of God, um, the results thereof, the mortals, could be construed as evil when actually it's the righteous judgments of the Creator. So, so that's what's meant there. Why does a living man complain about the punishment of his sins? In my voluntary work with persons recovering from, from drug addiction and alcohol addiction, very often persons, they, they get themselves into a terrible pickle with their consequences. I would say almost every day or so every other day, I'm talking to someone, well, I would say pretty much every day, sometimes more than once a day, I'm talking with persons that are enduring consequences of their drinking and drugging. And they're, they're praying for deliverance from the consequences of their own actions. See, as it says here, why does a living man complain a man for the punishment of his sins? You see, in other words, they need to change their actions. You see, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, change of mind, change of heart, and a change of direction. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to Jehovah. Let us lift up our heart with our hands to Elohim in the heavens. We've transgressed and have rebelled and you've not pardoned. You've covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain, you have not spared. You've covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. You've made us the offscouring and refuse in the midst of the peoples. All our enemies have opened their mouth against us. Fear in the pit have come upon us, devastation and ruin. So the call to repentance of the godly prophet Jeremiah in that scene, very likely Jeremiah here was in Egypt, uh, the place where the Jews had been brought out by great miraculous sovereign power and mercy of Elohim Yahweh, many hundreds of years before, they'd now fled back into Egypt for fear of the Babylonians. So the call to repentance, the call to obedience, the call to righteousness, the call to prayer and intercession. You get an insight here into the character of God. It says here that God covered himself with anger and pursued us. Think of that, friends. Think of Yahovah Elohim covering himself with anger and pursuing mankind. You have slain, you have not spared. You have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. Um, another important truth as well. Many persons in the modern era think that they have a right or they're entitled to have their prayers and requests heard by God. Not so, not so. Truly, truly, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But God is not obliged to listen to the prayers of mortals. Oh no, mortals are entirely subject to Elohim Yahweh. All flesh is entirely subject. You have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. So a nation can make God so angry that God covers himself with anger and doesn't listen to their prayers. But of course, uh, the, the, you see, this is the thing, you see. And the cessation of the monarchical, theocratic, rule of Israel, rule of El Inyawa through Israel, uh, 
that meant the end of national salvation, so to speak. You see, from that point on till today, there isn't a nation on this planet that could be described as being a true theocracy, true theocratic monarchy. See, you couldn't really say that. Well, well, I suppose you could say it about the saints, the redeemed, the lamb's wife, the holy nation, the body of Christ. You could, you could say it in those terms carefully. But be careful with what I say, then, friends, because there are groups, particularly in America, that teach false things. Such as Kingdom Now and the seven, is it the Seven Mountain Theory and other preposterous, erroneous twistings of scripture, false doctrines. But in truth, Elohim, Yahweh, through his son, Yeshua, through his wife, the congregation, the church, rules the whole planet at the present time. That is the truth. The influence of the lamb's wife is what dictates most of the actions of the United States government. And God, through the United States government, physically rules the planet. Uh, and that's the truth, you see. And that's the safety and preservation and well-being of Israel at the present time. But in no way could you state that uh, the United States government is a theocratic monarchy in the same way that Israel was. Uh, 3,000 years ago, so you, you could truly say that. this is my point. So the cessation of Yisrael, of Yashuel, as a nation, um, 2,600 years ago, which is what we're reading here, that meant the end, of, well, of, of course, Israel was regathered uh, seven or eight decades after, uh, after the Babylonian captivity and became a nation again. They rebuilt the temple again. But we, we really see here, uh, it, it all, it's all an approach to the death of Christ. The, the, what Jeremiah endured in his very prolific um, and prolonged ministry, it's all the type of sufferings of Christ, you see. And of course, uh, they all led to, to the finished work of the Son of God on the cross in death, and then uh, uh, everything out of the tomb in Christ that will endure eternally. And the only thing that's left for those that don't believe in Jesus is the filthy rags of their own wickedness. Uh, even their righteousness are as filthy rags. In other words, culpability for the holy beard of Christ being ripped out. His face all bashed in, his back like a ploughed field. Responsibility for the sufferings of Jesus Christ. That's all that's left for those that don't have faith and trust in the Son of God. The only thing left in the empty tomb was the bloody linen cloths that had bound the body of Jesus in death. That's all there is. The Son of God is a mighty risen Saviour, friends. The sovereign of the whole planet. The wrath of God is upon those that do not believe. Well, friends, we'll be back soon with the broadcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, rejoice in the truth, walk in the light, stay under the blood. Uh, and the tender mercies, the goodnesses, the loving kindness of Yahweh Elohim will sustain thee in thy circumstances. Until next time, Baruch Hava Hashem Adonai Yahweh Elohim, the sovereign of the whole universe.